The Senate Judiciary Committee had planned to vote on Thursday to advance Brett Kavanaugh's Supreme Court nomination, but that timing is now in question. On Sunday afternoon, a woman named Christine Blasey Ford went public, alleging that Kavanaugh sexually assaulted her while both were high school students. Judge Kavanaugh has denied these allegations. So joining us now is Deborah Katz. She is the lawyer representing Christine Blasey Ford. Ms. Katz, thank you very much for being here. Let's sure. get to a question that is at the top of everyone's mind, which is, will your client, Christine Ford, be willing to testify in public to the Judiciary Committee? The answer is yes. She is willing to do it. Has she been asked by any of the lawmakers to do that? That's interesting. The answer is no. She's not been asked, but she is now willing to do so. Is she in conversations with people? Have people, have the lawmakers reached out and tried to talk to her via phone? We've heard from no one. We've seen various statements made on television, but uh, in statements uh, that are being bandied about for political reason, but no one's asked her, no. How did she come around to being willing to testify publicly? Because as we know the story, she really did not want to come forward. She wrote a confidential letter. So tell me the trajectory of her willingness now to go to such a public forum. Well, you're right. There was a great deal of uh, uh, ambivalence and about whether she wanted to be publicly associated with these allegations. and. Essentially, that choice was made uh, by her to remain confidential. She asked Senator Feinstein to keep her uh, letter and her allegations confidential, and Feinstein agreed to do that. And that decision was essentially taken away from her as those allegations uh, were leaked. And it uh, resulted in a great deal of pressure from uh, members of the media who knew she, who she was, who then uh, started really invading her privacy, showing up uh, at Stanford where she teaches, and leaving her notes and emailing her and calling her. And she knew that she was going to be, uh, her allegations were going to be outed. And that, in fact, is what occurred. And as a result, she decided to take control of this and tell this in her own voice. So while we have you, perhaps you can help us fill in the blanks on some of her story. Um, she was, says that she was at a party in probably 1982 in Montgomery County, Maryland. She says that there were four guys there. These are high school students, as was she. There were four guys there. Were there any girls there that day? Yes, there was, uh, there was another girl uh, at this party, yes. And has your client spoken to any of those other guys or that girl who could help corroborate her story? She has not. And why not? Is it time to do that? That's. That's not her job to do that. If this is going to be investigated, it should be done by investigators. So she also says that, that this happened, well, I'll just read, let me just read to you what she says happened, because I want to be able to say it in her own words. She says, Kavanaugh was on top of me while laughing with, and there was a redacted name, who we now know was Mark Judge, his friend, who periodically jumped on Kavanaugh. They both laughed as Kavanaugh tried to disrobe me in their highly inebriated state. With Kavanaugh's hand over my mouth, I feared he may inadvertently kill me. It took her a while to use the term attempted rape. It took her years to use that. But she stands by this account that I've just read? She does. And just to be clear, the reason she felt that he might inadvertently kill her is he had his hand over his, her mouth, and she was having a difficult time breathing. And he is larger, and he was pressing his weight against her. And so inebriated, he was ignoring the fact that she was attempting to scream and having a difficult time breathing. And uh, she believes that but for his inebriation and his inability to take her clothes off, he would have raped her. Here's what um, Brett Kavanaugh says. He's released a statement. Um, I categorically and unequivocally deny this allegation. I did not do this back in high school or at any time. So where does that leave your client? That leaves her knowing that she's told the truth. She's done it at great personal risk. Uh, she's now going to have to live uh, with the uh, tremendous efforts by people to annihilate her and to try to discredit her. She's telling the truth. She took a polygraph. She mentioned this to her uh, in her therapy sessions in 2012. 
She came forward before this nominee was nominated. This is someone who has told the truth at great personal cost, and we all know what she's going to have to withstand as a result of having come forward. Let's talk about that polygraph. As we understand it, she did it at your behest. You suggested that she do it, knowing that she, her veracity would be challenged. Would you be willing to release the results of that polygraph? I will to the appropriate authorities who wish to see it, yes. And who would those appropriate authorities be? Well, at this point, it's the Senate Judiciary Committee that has a constitutional obligation to vet this nominee. I think that Senator Feinstein was saying something to the effect of the FBI should be looking into that. Is that happening? I don't know what's happening at this point. Uh, that will be discussions that I'm sure we'll be having later today. Um, once your client saw Brett Kavanaugh be nominated, when she saw him up there with his beautiful family and people recommending him and the glossy PR campaigns for him and what a stellar record he has and all of these other women who have known him for years who have come forward to recommend his character. Did that give her pause? Did that change her calculation? She's somebody who's a very thoughtful person and she throughout this process was really weighing her civic duty which is really something that she takes quite seriously versus the personal cost that she would certainly have to incur if she came forward. And she really uh, struggled with that, and I think as anyone would. And as the hearings got closer, she continued to weigh that and saw that essentially um, this nominee was being rushed through, documents were being withheld, and she really made the calculation that no one would really listen to her. Uh, the um, the uh, Republican Party was determined to get this nominee through, and at that point she just felt that coming forward would be hopeless and she would uh, put her family and herself at great personal risk and chose not to. Unfortunately, that decision was taken from her. So when this letter, this confidential letter, went public and you say that then reporters were on the scent of it, did your client, Christine Ford, ever have a conversation with um, Senator Feinstein? We were in touch with her office. Uh, throughout this period, yes. Meaning that there was a direct conversation between your client and the senator? She spoke to the senator uh, very soon after she, uh, the letter was sent, which was July 30th. At that point, um, uh, Dr. Blasey retained counsel, and then communications went between staff and uh, Dr. Blasey's counsel. Because the question is, why did Senator Feinstein sit on the letter? Or is that your impression? What, no, what it was isn't. Senator Feinstein, I, well, I guess my question is, what, what was the point? What was Senator Feinstein supposed to do with this letter? OK, I just want to be clear. I think that's an unfair characterization. Um, in this moment, victims need to be able to control when and whether their stories become public. She went to her senator because she had information that she thought was very important that had bearing on the fitness uh, and character of this nominee. And throughout that period of time, Senator Feinstein's office was uh, eager for her to come forward. If she felt comfortable coming forward, there was no effort to dissuade her from coming forward. This was entirely this woman's decision. And I think that was appropriate. I think that's how victims of trauma and sexual violence must be treated. And so was that letter shared with the committee? Apparently, at a later point, it was. At a later point, meaning, but before the hearing. I'm just trying to get the timeline. Before the hearing, no, do you no, after it was the not hearing. shared. And and honestly, we made the request. My client made the request that Senator Feinstein treat her allegations confidentially, and Fen Senator Feinstein agreed to do so. I will say that the door was always open, and uh, the staff made it clear that if her, if she changed her mind, she could come forward. As Dr. Blasey saw these hearings unfold, her choice became more clear in her mind that she did not want to come forward. She saw this as a very highly politicized and uh, very brutal process, and she was not um, wanting to inject herself in this, because who would want to incur this kind of uh, really highly politicized uh, attack game that she now finds herself in? So, so she was fine with that decision, but that decision was taken away from her after the hearings when her, uh, her allegations were essentially uh, leaked. Uh, understood. So does Do what does Dr. Blasey want now? Does Dr. Blasey want Brett Kavanaugh to sit on the Supreme Court or for his uh, approval, his confirmation to be blocked? 
That's not what she wants one way or another. She wants the Senate to do what it is constitutionally obligated to do. She's taken this great risk of coming forward. She's a credible person. These are very serious allegations, and they should be treated seriously, and she should be treated respectfully during this process. And unfortunately, at this point, she's already getting a lot of hostile threats and recrimination, and that is, of course, uh, quite disturbing and unfortunate. Indeed. Um, Deborah Katz, thank you very much for all the information. Please keep us posted sure. as we to will when do. lawmakers do reach out and if she's going to testify publicly. Thank you very will much. Will do. Thank you.